Welcome very much today to our webinar about equine society. We are here with Danny Whitty from Lonely Whale and the Oceans Hero Network, who focuses on major issues in today's world, and that is plastics in the ocean. They also organize a global annual boot camp for young people that we will talk about a bit today as well. You may wonder why we have a guest about eco-anxiety on our webinar because we're focused on mental health at Digging Deep. But in fact, the world and the planet and where we're going does impact the mental health of a lot of young people today. It is an issue that is on the rise in young people um, and people are starting to feel anxious about what's going on on our planet and it's affecting their mental health. With us also today is a current ocean hero, DJ Lyons from the Cayman Islands. She's also a VP of an organization called Prot Protect Our Future. And we'll dig it right in with some deeper introductions so that they can both tell us a little bit more about what they do. So Danny, can you tell me a little bit more about yourself and your organization and how you got involved with it? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I am the director of the Ocean Heroes Network um, at Lonely Well. Um, Lonely Well was founded in 2015 by actor Adrian Grenier and Lucy Sompner. And since 2015, we've worked on a ton of impact campaigns, most notably the Stop Sucking campaign that was focused on um, the ban on single-use plastic straws. Um, have focused on another campaign called uh, Hydrate Life, which is focused on single-use water bottles. And one of the programs that we co-lead with um, our partner, Captain Planet Foundation, is the Ocean Heroes Network, which is what I work on. So Ocean Heroes Network um, provides agency to youth and provides them with the tools and the resources to develop campaigns and take action against uh, plastic pollution and save our seas. So we we were founded in 2017, um, had our first boot camp in person in New Orleans in the following year in Vancouver, British Columbia. And this year we hosted a virtual boot camp amidst everything that's been going on um, around the world in the pandemic. Um, how I got involved with uh, Lonely Well, it's a funny story. I actually was um, a co-producer on the Museum of Plastic, which was our experiential pop-up um, campaign uh, attached to the Hydrate Light campaign at, at Lonely Well. And six months later, there was a position to move over to the team, which I happily did because I think um, the Ocean Heroes Network is incredible. Um, the youth that we work with are absolutely amazing and they actually create incredible change. To date, we've ha connected with over 6,000 youth between the ages of 11 and 18 um, and have trained over a thousand and provided the resources for them to develop their campaigns um, since inception. And now that we've gone virtual, we are looking to scale. Um, so that's a bit about me. Great. Uh, DJ, can you tell us a bit more about how you got involved with environmentalism and uh, Ocean Heroes Boot Camp? Um, okay. Uh, thank you again. Uh, hi, my name is DJ Lyons. I live in the Cayman Islands. I was born and raised here. And uh, my love for the ocean just started as soon as I was born. Because I was born on an island and I'm surrounded by water. So my love for the ocean runs very deep. <laughs> Um, but for a long time, I was kind of blind um, with my surroundings. I did not know that I actually needed to do something until I started getting more into like water sports. So I started swimming and we did jet skis and yes, that's not the best for the environment, but it's something we do a lot down here. Um, and we just started to do a lot more things. And then I realized like, what is going on? Like I'm seeing plastic in the ocean and I'm seeing the coral turning white instead of the fiery red or the oranges or blues it might be. So then I was like, okay, I, but I don't know what to do about it. And then I ended up going to my current school, Cayman International School, where I met Mr. Bill Lamont. Um, he is almost like our supervisor or our, our advisor um, for Protect Our Future, which that is the organization I am the vice president for. 
Um, so then he basically one day came up to me after a club called Green Team that I had got in involved with and asked me if I would want to be a part of Ocean Heroes. Um, it's a camp in Vancouver and it can be really life changing for you. And I was like, sure, let's go. And we went. And ever since that trip, I have not stopped advocating for change within the environment um, on my islands. When I came back, we kind of got um, thrown in to protect our future. Um, my counterpart, Ben Somerville, he's the president. He came with me to Vancouver. Um, so then he ended up taking lead. And then I'm kind of like his partner in crime. Um, and since then, we've had to do so many different kinds of projects, some that we did expect and others that we didn't. One major one was the cruise birthing facility that was proposed here. Um, thankfully, we got it to go away. <laughs> we protested a lot. Um, there was a lot of petitions, videos, advertisement, um, and it was us against the government. It was a really hard fight, but... Um, we were successful and I'm so grateful to everyone that got me here, um, including the Ocean Heroes um, Foundation because without them, I wouldn't have had the foundation to even know what a campaign was or um, how to speak in front of people, how to present myself and the actual environmental knowledge that I needed. Um, they actually helped me and provided some of, that, some of that for me. So I'm very thankful and that's my story. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. And I thank both of you for being here. For us on the Digging Deep side, of course, we really want to also focus on, you know, what does that all do with us as human beings and, you know, with the fears that we, that we may have inherent in us and our, our mental health. Um, but let's start off a little bit more broadly. So, uh, Danny, what, what, what is eco-anxiety for the people who just joined? Um, this is a, a webinar about eco-anxiety and how you know, we can use that anxiety to actually positively affect our future. So when we talk about that, Danny, what is eco-anxiety? Yeah, absolutely. I think a lot of people are familiar with the concept of anxiety, and it's definitely at the forefront of a lot of people's minds, um, especially over the past 10, 20 years um, with the inception of technology and the rapid change there. But the intersection of um, the environment and creating anxiety in, comes down to the term eco-anxiety. Uh, it's the sense of anxiety felt when you start to worry about things related to climate change or environmental issues. Um, really, it boils down to, you know, what is our future going to look like um, based on all the, the negative effects that, um, are happening in our world contributing to um, climate change and the environment. I would venture that a lot of people are actually feeling that. Um, not that many people maybe talk really about what effect the environment has on them, more about the obvious things of what is happening. But what do you feel, who are the most vulnerable to, to really feel that anxiety? Um, and, uh, and, and what do you think um, that what we could do about it? I, I will take take the first lead, but I'd love for Deje to weigh in here too. I think, um, I mean, personally for me, I my path into environmentalism started later in life, um, which being a part of the Ocean Heroes Boot Camp has really opened my eyes and I've been inspired by uh, the agency and the empowerment that youth have today, um, taking action for the environment. Um, and I think for me, growing up in a small Texas town that's right near the coast where there's a bunch of uh, plastic plants and um, chemical plants, um, it was just a way of life. Um, plastic, plastic was just integrated into our lives from our jobs and the economy and such. But now being a part of Lonely Well and Ocean Heroes Network, I would have to say that I think activists and people that are really aware of um, the changes and the facts, people that believe in, in climate change, which is a known fact, definitely affected by eco-anxiety. And I think um, people around coastal areas um, especially are impacted because they see the direct impact in the ocean. I think Dejay can, can speak to that as well, but really anyone who's aware or 
potentially going to be apparent also in thinking about the future with the state of the world right now. I think wondering what the environment and what our earth is going to look like for future generations, it impacts everyone differently. But I think um, mm -hmm. those that are trying to make change, it definitely impacts the most because we can get discouraged by everything that is happening. But Jay, I'd love, I'd love for you to take a hit at this question. Yeah, I also think um, communi communities that are definitely in some economic crises, they feel it a lot. You know, I see it here. There's a lot of people that do want to become environmental and um, rather than using a styrofoam plate, use a paper plate. But that styrofoam plate is less expensive than the paper plate. And that goes for a lot of things, a lot of materials. Um, and just life in general, sometimes living eco-friendly is way more expensive than living freely and just not really caring about the environment. Like solar panels, um, we have so much sun here, but solar panels here are out of this world, the expenses, you know? So I think that is definitely some of the people that also really feel it. So besides the people who are fighting for the change, it's people that may want to change but can't afford it because of their economic status. Yeah, I think that's a that's a really good point. And it also brings up sort of the flip side of it, right? There are also people that are actually making a living off those uh, of packaging and plastics and, and other things. And I think uh, if I were to add to that, I think a lot of those people working in that industry actually do see the problem and they may even be feeling some of that anxiety themselves. And, I, I, I happen to know that some of the some of these packaging companies are working on solutions, um, but it does, as you say, it moves slowly because it is a lot more expensive to produce sometimes. It's a lot more expensive to distribute, to educate people. And, and so I think there's a there's also on that side, we should give them at least a little bit of credit as well in that they are realizing it. And some of them are even anxious about it themselves, I, I would uh, I would venture. Um, so, I, yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry. No, I, I absolutely agree with that statement. I think that it's tough whenever someone realizes the facts around pollution and plastic pollution and the production of plastic as a whole um, and that they might be contributing to it because it's been ingrained in our society and people do make a living off of producing um, plastic or working in plants that negatively affect our environment but that might be their only way to um, obtain an income that allows them to, to live so really I think it's a it's a global problem um, it's a policy problem and it's a it's an economic issue as well that um, I think really needs to be taken taken by the reins and led by leaders uh, at the policy level to really affect that change, but also education of those who may not know, um, that's the first step. So. Yeah, that makes sense. And Dejay, you were talking a little bit about some of the things that we could do each, you know, as individuals about it, like, you know, switch out for some more um, conscious choices, if, if you will. Uh, what would you say are, are things that, that come to mind for you? How, how, do you? how does that make you feel when you see people, for example, taking those choices or not taking those choices? Um, a lot of the times I'm the person that's like, you. <laughs> so as you guys, I told you guys today, you know, I just got my car and stuff and, you know, I'm on the road and my car is a plastic free zone. So no one can bring any sorts of plastic inside there. So but then there's some of my friends that are going to be like, oh, yeah, like, you know, that's awesome. I'll make sure every single time I'm in the car with you, you know, I'll bring my metal straws and my um, bamboo fork and spoon and knife and things like that. But then there's going to be those friends that are going to be a bit more defiant, you know. Um, but that goes back to education and economics and social issues. Um, so it's wishy-washy because sometimes I do understand where, where certain people are coming from if they can't afford it they just can't and I'm not going to force someone to go out and buy something that in my eyes may be a necessity but in their case scenario is is not so um yeah I just think it's depending on 
each situation because each situation is also going to be different because if I know you know better but you're not doing what you're supposed to do especially if you're a part of an environmental group or you're advocating for change and you're not practicing what you're preaching that is when I'm going to get really upset but if you don't know any better then that's why I'm here to educate you you know and bring awareness to the issues so like I said it's it's case by case basis yeah, but those are all, all good points, I think. Um, Danny, you uh, obviously you work for an organization that has set that to to um, you know to change out to to set out to change something around the world. And by the way, I was just in Poland in a tennis camp, and I saw the hashtag stop sucking, and I just had to smile because I remember that from from LA very well. We just got to Poland as well, so I think that's fantastic. Um, but how does that how does that make you feel? You know, dealing with that every day, just just from an, an, a mental health um, state. Because while you're not like a first responder to a crisis, this is something that has a a huge responsibility and also an impact uh, to 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 work in a field like this. So, can you talk a little bit about the mental health side of it for yourself and and also what you observe in others? Yeah, absolutely. And and what you just spoke to reminds me of a episode of Hidden Brain. Um, on NPR, a podcast that I listen to, um, where they interview a uh, climate scientist and he speaks to the fact that change, this such big change, and it takes everyone working together from governments to corporations to individuals to really create that change and it's more expensive and it's harder. Um, but being that it's such a big issue, people can be complacent about it or turn it down because a lot of the impacts that are felt are in the future. So I think for me, what we've done at Lonely Well prior to me starting the Stop Sucking campaign, I think helped cr create an entry point into awareness of plastic pollution by something that's not Necess not a necessity for the majority of people, a straw, a plastic straw, and then making them rethink their actions based on um, like what is the need and what is the, the detriment. So it's a really small change that highlights um, the global issue, but it's something that doesn't really change your day-to-day -day life. And I think as humans, we like to be comfortable and we like to be, um, <clears throat> oh man, comfortable as well as have convenience at our fingertips and we've been trained that way through the industrial revolution and that campaign really shined a spotlight on like small actions can create a big change and hopefully that leads to bigger change so whenever I mean I live in Manhattan and I see plastic cups from coffee shops plastic straws from bodegas packaging the rise of direct-to-consumer shipments um, you just see it everywhere and I think especially in a in a metroplex as affluent as New York it's really it's it can be overwhelming when you go out and you meet up with a friend or a family member and it they're in instead of using you know metal forks at home they use paper or plastic um, for convenience sake uh, without really thinking about the future so I mean, it's definitely a source of anxiety for me because it does take a fundamental uh, mental shift in the, the community and the in civilization as a whole. Um, so it's definitely something I, I think about. Um, and I know a bit later, I think I, I wanna speak to, and I know DJ will as well, like how we cope with that and how we stay true and dedicated to the work that we are doing and stay optimistic as well. Um, but it's definitely something that I recognize I, I face, I mean, being new to the space, but, um, it definitely has made me reflect on my past as well and want to educate others and, and work to create that change as well. Yeah, that, and, and that, uh, makes total sense as well. Maybe DJ from your, from your perspective, can you talk a little bit about, you know, do you is this something you feel daily is this something that just pops up when when something happens or what kind of emotions you know can arise when 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 you point out something or when you even when you talk to other people about it because that's also you know you're a young activist which 
is very commendable, but it's also a huge responsibility. Um, and there as well, right, that, uh, that can sometimes weigh heavily as well. Um, so maybe you can talk a little bit about both sides privately, but also yeah. then having that responsibility. Um, so I, I just have all around anxiety. <laughs> um, that's something I struggle with, but eco anxiety is whew, very high. My level of eco anxiety skyrockets. <laughs> um, I feel it daily. Um, just to give you some examples of why I feel it every day. Um, my school is located right beside a mountain of trash. Um, every day there is some sort of new development um, that ha that may have um, affected our mangrove population, which um, helps us be protected from natural disasters such as hurricanes. Um, what else? Like just driving, simple things is just driving down the road and seeing the amount of garbage people have thrown out of their their cars because they're too lazy to actually take it out of their cars and throw it into their own garbage you know so I feel equal anxiety every day and it's it's something I do recognize but other days I don't um and usually when I do recognize it it's usually a very I'm overcome with a lot of either sadness anger or passion so the sadness comes in where I just like, I'm so confused why people just don't understand what their actions are doing. Like their actions have consequences and um, everything everyone does has a butterfly effect. So what are you thinking throwing, you know, those Popeye's paper cups and plastic straws and lids outside, you know, just on the ground when we have all different kinds of species in the Cayman Islands. So like, you know, if anything goes to eat it now and they'll probably just end up, you know, dying because that's not a part of their their food, you know, that's not, that's not normal, that's not natural. So um, that's my sadness because I think about all the animals and how it's gonna affect us in the long run. But it's anger because once again, I just don't understand why people don't know better, especially the adults, you know, because you're older you, you should be setting an example for your kids or your nieces or your nephews that are all younger than you and they're they're not doing that you know but then passion because it makes me feel like I still have more work to do and I sp I've spoken to my mom about this a thousand times that even after I leave and unfortunately this is my last year as vice president of protect our future because I'm going off to university next year obviously they're still going to be my family but I'm going to have to continue my work on my own, you know, um, not saying I'm not going to find a new organization or create a new one, but the work that we do never stops. And I mean, maybe one day it will, but it's not going to be right now, you know, which is sad to say, but we just still have a lot of work to do as different communities, different countries, regions, and as a world as a whole. So yeah, that's, that's how I feel about <laughs> that. To Jay, too, I think, um, and, and Rosemary, as you know, this year was the first year at our boot camp that we focused on some new issues, um, intersectionality and diversity, inclusion, and equity um, within the environmental space was something new that we focused on, which is another source of anxiety um, with everything that's happened, I mean, globally, but also specifically in the States right now. But then we also introduced mindfulness tracks um, within our boot camp because we recognize that e not only is anxiety real with with our youth and they're sensing it now, especially more so with COVID not being able to socialize from kids as young as three, four, people are recognizing it. Um, but we, we introduced a track which uh, Shadow's Edge was a, a big piece of, as well as, um, Blue Mind Practice, which um, was developed by Dr. Wallace J. Nichols, which is the practice of the feeling that you get when you're in, on, around, or visualize water, um, and that feeling you have that gives you that blue mind to think clearly and know what you're fighting for. And I think, Vijay, one question I had for you is, you I know from working with you for a couple of months, you grew up going to these going to the water, you're surrounded by it in the Caymans. And 
you're diving and you're seeing all of the animals and over your life, which has been relatively short com comparatively on like the, you know, age of the earth and then also just like human lifespan, you've seen it change at a rapid pace. Mm -hmm. And I can only imagine that going to the ocean to, you know, sit and reflect and be around it, that is is also troubling because you're seeing the effects even more so. Um, do you feel that whenever you do go out to the ocean or does it like, what is the balance there between your engagement with the water as well as, you know, seeing the, the results of, of plastic pollution too? Um, I feel it. I just feel it all the time. <laughs> I, and I do really feel it when I go to the beach. Um, one of the reasons is because there are, is a lot of development on the beach which has had our shorelines receding so you know say there is like this much maybe 20 years ago and now it's this much so it's looking at that it's like how much beach are we gonna have left you know in a, the next five years you know it's scary because the beach is is all I know. It's literally all I know and literally was one of my first loves. So seeing it be affected by things such as development or plastic, it's tough. I mean, yes, I can do my little cleanup so and I can talk to new developers coming on island and maybe trying to get them to develop somewhere else, but there's only so much one person can do. There's only so much one organization can do. You know, we can try as hard as we can, but there's a lot of limitations, especially being a youth activist. Um, and being 17 in the Cayman Islands is tough because for just any age younger than 18, because you can't vote, you know? So, I mean, I'll be able to vote next year, but it's, I've been waiting a long, 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 long time for that opportunity so that at least my ballot can make a change and my decision or my voice could be heard in maybe a very small way, but it could be powerful enough because my ballot could be that one ballot to change who is going to be my minister of my district. So, yeah, yeah. but back to your question more specifically I do feel it all the time and we just have to keep working like there's nothing else that we can do but we just have to continue to work and it's when eco-anxiety comes in where sometimes me personally I'll have really intrusive negative thoughts and I'll ask myself if my work is enough am I doing enough like am I really making an impact like I, like is it working and I have to just nip it in the bud and tell myself that, you know, what I've learned is enough. What I've accomplished is enough, you know, and most importantly, the impact that I've made on people's lives is enough. So yeah, that's, that's for that question. It's, it's a lot. Um, eco anxiety is full of layers and different um, aspects and everyone is going to experience it differently. And like you mentioned before, there's going to be people who don't realize that they have it. And then there's going to be people that are constantly overwhelmed with it every single day. So, you know, I feel like it's important for everyone to at least recognize it. And I think that's the first step. Um, and then from there, you come up with the steps you're going to do in order to combat that. Yeah, and I, I believe it's, uh, you know, not necessarily always, as you say, anxiety for people, but there's also just a sadness. So there was a survey that has been done in 2015 and then also again last year. And, you know, now 62% of those people surveyed said that they were at least worried about the, the climate and 21% actually described themselves as very worried. And that's a lot more, you know, than, than in 2015. Um, I also think that there's a lot of people that think that they don't, they can't have an impact. Um, but personally, I mean, I live in Switzerland. We are quite clean compared to the left to the rest of the world as far as plastics goes. You know, quite advanced in that. Uh, but it's not just plastics, right? It's it's in general, it's global warming. Um, I've just spent a, a week somewhere in a in a vacation resort in the mountains and. 
I know from my childhood where that glaché was and where it is now, right? And how much that has receded. And yet there's still people saying that there is no global warming. Um, so I think that it's, it's not just maybe anxiety always, but sometimes it's just also a sadness, you know, to see things that, that we just, we can't experience anymore. And also our kids won't be able to experience anymore. And I think that's something that can really, really help us drive because I think that um, having, uh, you know, that responsibility towards your kids is also something that could be very motivating. What, what do you think about that, Denny, um, in relation, you know, to parents and, and how they could have an impact and how they could handle kids that do have uh, worries about the environment? Yeah, absolutely. Um, as, uh, as an expecting father, it's something that I constantly think about. Um, and to your point, wanting to ensure that the, the natural spaces that I've been to are, are safe for the future generations that are also clean and not polluted, or it, it's something that I absolutely think about. I think um, something that for me personally, I feel like you can't be so hard on yourself if you're making the change and doing the work and you have to step back and celebrate small accomplishments. Um, as well as be optimistic about the future. And I think not only within the boot camp where we organize youth from around the world to get together, um, where they're able to make connections and have that perspective and, and kind of bond over the issues and have that network. Um, but organizations as a whole within this space really do come together and support each other. When thinking about parents and how to, um, you know, convey that message and the importance to their children, I think it's making them very aware of like what the history of plastic and, and climate change is from the start and then getting them involved in organizations. And I'm not saying that every young person needs to be an activist and working like multiple organizations and, um, you know, dedicating their whole entire life to it, but being educated and then trying to implement change and making them aware um, of what the future holds and being able to, when they are able to vote, make that change and convince others too. Um, I think that's the biggest um, you know, piece of advice for me for parents, but then also making sure that at a young age, you're getting your, your children involved in the ocean, involved in nature, so they can realize the beauty and realize what's at stake. Um, I think that's really the first step. Um, and then educating them on like, this may or may not be here. And it's dependent on all of us, but really uh, the youth have the power to change and their power and their voice as you know, I've seen from DJ is so, can be so much stronger than adults in, in creating that change. Yeah, I, I agree very much with that. We have uh, very many youth ad advocates, uh, which are just really so powerful and so strong to convey the message also about, you know, how tools like Shadow's Edge can help with, with mental health. And just to, to come back to the mental side of things a bit, um, I want to ask both of you, you know, when you start feeling anxious and when you have, you know, uh, fears potentially or, or sadness or anger, how do you cope in those moments? What, what do you do? What are, what are your tips and tricks maybe for our listeners? Jay, maybe Danny, you want to start? start? Um, I was actually looking at something that just helps me in general um, because I'm sitting at my desk. Um, these are essential oil rolls. I don't know if you can see them. Mm -hmm. um, uh, these really help to calm me down. At first, I thought my mom was going crazy. I was like, how can an oil that has a scent help you um this and sitting down at the beach and watching the sunset because I always remember watching the sunset that every ending can be beautiful you know that's one thing that always runs through my head um but yeah this and actually interacting with what's making you anxious so maybe it's going outside and cleaning up the garbage that you're seeing and thinking about oh my gosh what animals are gonna eat that and Oh, how are they going to die? Is it going to be a big population of animals? Whatever, whatever. Maybe plan a neighborhood cleanup. And that's another thing that I do is if I'm feeling anxious about something, 
I plan something. So it can be something as small as an actual neighborhood cleanup, or it can be something as big as a protest. So it it's just all depending on you. I think everyone, I mentioned before, everyone's anxiety is different. So everyone's going to have different coping mechanisms. I know when I sit down and I rub this on me and I listen to some Janae Aiko, I'm good. Like, I know, I think, especially in those moments, like, I know what my purpose is. You know, I know why I'm in Protect Our Future. I know why I'm working um, to save the environment that I'm around. You know, I know all those things. But for someone, that just may not work. So my next suggestion is actually going out and doing field work, whether it's actually planning something you can also learn about something, research things, um, go to your national trust, find out what they're doing, or your different um, oceanic organizations. Um, yeah, so it's just all depending on what works for you. Um, but yeah, these, these things definitely save me a lot. <laughs> yeah, and I... I also use a, a lavender oil whenever I go to sleep. I love it. Mm -hmm. um, I would say breath is so important. And taking, like, whenever I notice myself getting anxious or concerned, um, it's easy to start to become negative and um, pessimistic about things. But I think something that's so important is recognizing how much power you have in your breath and taking that moment to stop. And that could be, you know, writing in a journal and getting out your, your thoughts and just putting it on paper, um, allowing you to breathe. It could be connecting with nature around you um, and just taking that moment to really reset um, and doing something creative and having an outlet as well. Um, but I think overall, knowing that the work that, you know, everyone in this space is doing is making an impact and remaining optimistic is so key. Um, and I think that's, you can really realize what your steps are and you can connect with people more clearly if you have a clear mind and, and even just take a moment to breathe before you react. Yeah, and just to add on to that really quickly. Um something that he said kind of clicked um words are very powerful like very very powerful so my another suggestion of mine is affirmations um like I had an exam this morning and I was like I'm not gonna fail I will pass you know so if you're trying to get um a campaign to come through and go through government and be passed my campaign is not going to fail it is going to pass one way or another and just keep fighting. You just have to keep on telling yourself because like Danny said, like you have to be optimistic and you have to believe in yourself and you just have to disregard of those intrusive negative thoughts because they're really not true. They're not worth it. Just disregard of them because like I said, words are very powerful and thoughts are very powerful. Like what you speak can come into existence and so you just want to make sure that what you are saying is very positive and optimistic and just very affirmative. Yeah, I would agree with that. And um, also, I think that, you know, don't underestimate the power that you have as an individual, because even if you just influence two or three people in your surroundings and they then influence one person, et cetera, you get this ripple effect over a slow time. Obviously, it's not like a quick fix, but, you know, we, each of us can do something about it. Um, Jay, what's something that you think in, in your age group, what's something that you would tell them about eco-anxiety and about, you know, what, uh, why this crisis exists, if you, if you could part one thing to them? Uh, my generation or the older one? Your generation. Um, I'll just tell them that it's real. And I think that there's a lot of people that just think it's a misconception or that it's fake or you know, someone is over-exaggerating about the way that they feel um, when it is something that people deal with and I'm not going to say suffer from because I think it's, in a way, it is a good thing to have because that means you're conscious of your surroundings and what's going on around you. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of people just need to understand that this is real. It's not fake. It's not a show. Um, yeah, there, there's not much I can say about that. But I think even for the adults, like, it's real. Is very very real and it's something that a lot of people struggle with um, whether it's 
very severe or very minute. Do you think that there's a, a big difference between people your generation and, and older generations in how they perceive things? And you know, do they have a different perspective on climate that you can observe? Um, yes and no. I think there are some people in the older generation that realize their mistakes. I think why I think that's why there's a lot of um, there's quite a few older people who do advocate for the environment, especially here because the Cayman Islands has certainly developed a lot over the last 10 years. Um, and so seeing some of the things that we used to have and now they're not here anymore and they're gone, a lot of the older people, especially when it was coming onto the port project, they were so against it because in a way we had already lost so much from some of the decisions that they had made when they were younger. Um, but then there's also older people that are maybe ignorant, you know, and just not realize, you know, how their consequences are affecting us and how it's going to affect our grandkids and our actual kids and stuff like that. Um, and I think it's vice versa for the youth. There's a lot of people, um, even in my geography class, like there's people that believe in it it's right there in the textbook you you can see it we watch all these videos and stuff like that and then there might be that one person that's like oh climate change isn't real you know nothing is going to happen um our waters aren't getting hotter um the salinity isn't changing our reefs aren't bleaching i'm not seeing any of that when it's clearly right in front of their faces so i think there are some people that will have the same opinion as the older generation i just think like once again, everyone is different, um, whether it's due to their culture, their religion, just general beliefs, um, the way that they were raised, stuff like that. So I, I think it's depending on the actual individual because I don't want to stereotype the different generations because not everyone is the same. Yeah. And maybe Danny, similar question to you as well. Do you see that there is a, a, a change coming up with the people that you work with? Um, do you, because I, it, for me, I, I find, I notice that with my nephews and nieces who are a little bit younger than I am, they, they are much more conscious than maybe, you know, friends around me or family. And so that gives me a lot of hope for the future. So I just wonder how you see that, Danny. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think something that really makes me aware of the difference between youth and my generation, the generation before me is you're not set in your ways. You, as you continue to develop, you kind of close your mind. A lot of people, you know, get set in their ways and they don't want to change and they don't recognize that they can make an impact and then feel like it's too far gone. It's something, pass it on to the next generation to deal with. And that's just the way it works. I think what's great about Ocean Heroes Boot Camp and really youth in general is it's, they have, they're uninhibited. They are, com they are not numb to um, being maybe neglected or um, uh, like shot down and they're super resilient and they tend to have more of an open mind and are more receptive to hearing information and then making that change. Um, so I do think while the older generation is set in their ways, I think it takes something to directly impact them personally to then think about it differently if they aren't open-minded versus the folks that are open-minded and able to see the error in their past ways and the problems in the world and then consciously make that change. But I, it's definitely fewer, it diminishes over time, I think, with age, which um, is, is really important because I think for youth to speak up to, and someone within a family or an organization, they, youth has the power to make the older generation rethink their actions because of their influence of being young. So I see the, the, the youth having a challenge of being young, but also in an extreme amount of power to create change within the older generations as well, because they are more influential than I think a lot of them think. 
Yeah, which is also a very excellent point. Sometimes, you know, anxiety is not the worst thing to actually drive change. So do you think that with anxiety and stress about the environment being on the rise, that could be actually a driver to, for us to help solve some of these problems potentially? Yeah, I mean, I absolutely. I think anxiety is a healthy reaction. It's just on the spectrum, where does it sit? Um, and also, I think now more than ever, there's more ways, as much as there's more issues to be anxious about, there's also more resources out there and that are provided and awareness about mental health and acceptance of mental health that um, we didn't have before to utilize. And it's becoming, as much as the environment's becoming like more of a topic in, in, in the spotlight than ever, I think mental health is as well. So it's, it's kind of on a parallel path. Um, so I, I think a bit of anxiety is healthy, but the, having coping mechanisms um, and then taking action as well um, is super important because you don't want to get too anxious where you feel paralyzed, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I do, I'm like, I'm hopeful for the upcoming generation to have these tools and to be practicing it even in their, their elementary and, and secondary schools. Um, it's more available, but there's also a lot more issues to uh, take on. Yeah, I, I agree with that. It's actually, uh, that's a good point with the tool. So on, with Shadow Zeds, we focus on the mental health side of things, right? And, and um, just as an information for people that are listening, we are joining forces with uh, Ocean Heroes and running a campaign in, in November to really raise awareness about the issue and about what could be done um, just from a mental health perspective, how you can face things, deal with things, how you can take action and really take an active role in your mental health. Um, as you start focusing on, on uh, eco and on climate change. But there's also other tools out there. I mean, gaming, we chose gaming because we believe gaming is a very powerful tool because it has storytelling. It has an immersive way of telling people things. It's very good for learning. And it also can be fun to really explore and experiment um, and figure out you know, how you can make change. And along that lines, I mean, there's a couple of, of resources that we will put in a list um, that are actually really fun and cool as well that focus on either water or oceans or plastics or environmental climate change and one of them for example being mission 1.5 where you can vote on climate change issues and developments around the world um, in, a, in a in a very fun way and i think that just really raising awareness about those types of tools and actions you can take is, is very uh, important as well and with that in mind um, DJ, can you talk a little bit about your experience, you know, at the uh, boot camp that you were at and, and what you observed there and how taking that action made you feel? Um, well, I had the opportunity to go last year when it was not online, which I loved it online too, don't get me wrong. <laughs> um, last year's ex experience was life-changing and like I said, um, I'm forever grateful for everyone that, one, helped me to get there um, and to all the people that were there at the actual camp to help me, you know, get along, especially as like a first time campy, you go in and, you know, you're in a room full of 300 kids that all have the same passion as you, but are dealing with different issues from different perspectives, different cultures. So it's, it's really nerve wracking. Um, and then you get into your squad and it's so much fun to start to interact with people. And that is where you really start to make some actual um, lifetime friendships, I would say. Um, there are some of the girls that I met last year. Um, one of them was actually a, um, a squad leader this year as well. And we actually did a joint call. Um, she was all the way in India. And so we had to figure out like the time zones and stuff like that. And, you know, it worked out really well. And we got to network with each other and, you know, interact with each other, even though we couldn't see each other this year in person. Um, that just to show you, you know, the kind of friendships you're able to create. And, you know, we don't only talk about environmental things, but personal issues that we may have. And, we always know we're there for each other and supporting each other's campaigns and stuff like that. So 
that is one thing that Ocean Heroes Ocean Heroes has done and then it provides so many networking opportunities um like I said you're in a room of 300 kids that have the same passion as you there might be maybe one campy that has the same exact idea as you and collaborating with them can be such a like powerful thing um I uh, got the opportunity to also collaborate with someone for um Oceans Day this year and we made a video and just basically raised awareness about what people can do for Oceans Day and it was such an amazing video and you know people actually took those things that we suggest suggested and you know started it and in including it into their everyday lives you know so things like that as well and then just basic information like I learned so much being there at camp um it was so weird because I was like, okay, like we're just going to do a lot of activities. I may learn a couple of things. It's not going to be a lot. And then I like went home. I brought a notebook with me and it was like full. And I was like, what? Like this makes no sense. But, you know, it, that is, I think those are the three things that, um, that and resources as well. Because there is a point system that I really enjoy. And, you know, once they see that you're actually working and working on your campaign, um, you almost get these, um, you can call them vouchers in terms of like, um, they send you some, some resources to help you with your campaign or help you out, um, to, um, with your campaign to further the progress of it and stuff like that. So those four main things are what my experience was last year. And then this year, the information actually topped itself. It was crazy. And then being a squad leader this year was absolutely amazing and a new experience for me and it was just it's always a lot of fun being there yes it's really educational but you just have a lot of fun too so I definitely recommend to any of the parents or um, guardians if you do have a child um, that is within the age bracket like sign them up because <laughs> it is something that is it's worth it it's really worth it um, so we're almost at the end of our webinar, and I just, because you mentioned a few resources and, and tools, JJ, I also want to ask Danny, what are some very simple things, you know, if we have concerns, if we are anxious, how do we go about putting some of those into action in just everyday life, you know, if we don't want to, like, really do a big campaign or, or protest something, what, what are things we can do, simple choices we can make? Yeah, absolutely. I think... Um your power is with the dollar that you spend. Um, so whenever you go to the store, um, taking reusable bags, um, investing in a single use, or not a single use, but a, a like a metal or long-term use water bottle, but then also not trying to buy the next new water bottle, but ensure that you're using it through its life cycle. Um, I think Two, something that I personally do is whenever I go to my local coffee shop, I take my own cup. Um, so those small changes, those small shifts requires a bit more work, but in the grand scheme of things, it's making a much bigger impact than you can ever imagine. And then I think also everyone has a network of friends or family. And I think gifting them and educating them at the same time is also something that can help as well. Um, and I mean, I think it's such an explosive time for alternatives to plastic as well as just like eco-friendly products, like whether that's dishwashing soap or detergent. Um, it's, it's exciting to explore those different options. And if you're able to, to research them and, and pick them up, it's a new experience and you can feel good about using it as well. Great. Well, that's, Fantastic. Um, Lacey, did, do we have any questions that you can see from our audience? I know a lot of our audience are reduced to uh, listening to this on YouTube because of the current Zoom issues. Um, we do not currently have any questions, but they can always um, send us an email at feedback at shadowsedge.com. And we have a message from one of the attendees as well saying, for interested guardians, there'll be an Ocean Heroes Guardian session with Rachel Sarnoff this Friday. 
Um, so what we'll do is we will publish that as a comment with the, with the release of this video, uh, with the details to that in the link. We also will have a resource list available with some of the tools that we've talked about, like these games that, uh, that people could play. Um, we'll uh, make sure that there's some um, information to the Ocean Heroes uh, organization and the boot camp and some other things on there. Um, so if you want any of those resources, then please just check it out on our YouTube and on LinkedIn. And you can always send us an email at uh, feedback at shadowsedge.com to get those, that list as well, just in case we can't find it on our online resources. And I also want to point out, you know, that you can just uh, look up Ocean Heroes. It'll come up quite easily when you Google, as well as Lonely Whale, who are supporting plastic in the oceans, in it, or no plastic in the oceans, I should say, initiatives. So I want to thank both of our guests for being here today. It's been really amazing. Do you have any last things that you would like to say, Dejay, Danny? Thank you so much for having us. It's been incredible to partner with you on the boot camp this year, and I'm excited about our upcoming um, program together. And I think this is such an important topic and the work that y'all are doing at Digging Deep in Shadow's Edge is, is really important, especially for youth at this time. So just grateful that uh, you had me on the call. Thank you very much. I'm so thankful to be here with all of you lovely people. Thank you to everyone who is watching or listening or however you're viewing this. Um, but I just want to remind everyone that, you know, eco, once again, eco-anxiety is real. And if you have it, we did propose ways to um, cope with it. And, you know, I guess all of us are here to answer any of your questions if you can find us on any of the platforms. So always feel free to reach out and ask any questions that you guys have and yeah just thank you again for the opportunity and i hope to see you guys soon and again i i know that a lot of people found us through linkedin um so we will also publish obviously the list of resources on linkedin and um the recording of this webinar so people can can re-watch it um, and we'll make sure that all the links to find us and to really talk to any of us about it are also online and, and clearly findable for you all. So thank you very much for joining us today. And with that, I hope that you have an excellent day, afternoon, evening or night, wherever you are. <laughs> and we hope to see you in our next webinar next month again. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you again, Rosemary. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Have a great day. Same to you.